This is the Create Your Own Life Show, where we talk about things that matter. We're free thinkers and we don't believe in participation trophies. We're not afraid and unapologetically ourselves. It's time to create your own life. Hey, what's up, everybody? Jeremy here, and guys, I'm very excited for today's conversation. Today's guest is a former pro baseball player that discovered the key to looking svelte. Uh, He has been known to eat large quantities of meat and also post them on Twitter. He's discovered the key to what's making America fat, and he's helping to change that. Welcome to the show, Alex Feinberg. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Very excited to be here. So I want to find out first and foremost, man, like how did you kind of get into this whole world? I know you have a a sports background, but how did you kind of get into the nutrition and and fitness world? It was never my intention. Um, Okay. But one thing that I noticed when I was a Vanderbilt baseball player was that everybody who was in good shape and spoke well got treated better than everybody who was not in good shape and didn't speak well. And I was an economics major and I saw this as like an arbitrage opportunity where, oh, wow, the labor market rewards people with certain characteristics that ostensibly have nothing to do with their ability to perform a job and they get paid more money for doing the same thing. When I get done playing sports, if I don't make millions of dollars in baseball, which I didn't, I need to figure out a way to get every advantage that I possibly can in the labor market, which means I need to, I need to look good. I need to look energetic. Um, And so when I was trying to break into tech, which was the second career path that I found after getting done with pro baseball, I was in decent shape at the time and and I was able to elevator pitch my way into Google um, Mm. simply by being in good shape, speaking well and telling a good story. And so it was very important to me early on in my career to always be in good shape because of the ancillary advantages that it gave me, even if it had nothing to do with my health um, or, or dating advantages. It was merely the, the professional advantages that I was uh, desiring. Mm. And at the same time, you know, I didn't want fitness to dominate my life. I, I had right. a, a social life. I had a professional life. I didn't want to spend more than an hour a day in the gym, and I wasn't trying to weigh and measure all my food. I happened to really enjoy eating, and yeah. I wasn't trying to eat sissy salads. You know, to me, mm-hmm. no amount of ab definition was worth eating salads and going hungry. So that was completely off the table from day one. Um, An interesting thing happened in 2014 when I started changing my approach to training Um, away from the calorie based approach that most people uh, take and more towards a performance based approach, which was similar to what I did as an athlete, but I wasn't expecting it to have the results that it had metabolically. And so, you know, long story short, I shifted my training away from volume and away from duration and more towards speed and intensity. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was I needed to rest more because you can't train as much when you're training harder. I needed to do less, which means I was burning fewer calories in the gym, but then fat just started melting off my body Mm. and all the literature at the time did not suggest that this was supposed to happen. I did not do this thinking that fat would melt off my body. I had no idea how much fat I had to lose at the time, but I also took note of a um, you know a side effect, a very a very welcome side effect that I didn't think was an accident. And so, rather than uh, say, "Oh, you know, that's cool," I'll kind of dismiss it, go back to doing what I was doing before. It's like, no, let me double down on this because it seems to be working for reasons I can't explain. And mm-hmm. so, from 2014 to you know 2019, I just started experimenting with my diet and training with basically two rules. Uh, one rule in training is you're not allowed to train harder than you have been, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you're not allowed to dr- train so hard that you dread coming back to the gym the next day because I needed it to be sustainable and fit with my work life. And then from a diet standpoint, I was willing to make any changes as long as it didn't require me to forego eating delicious food or ever go hungry. And so what that meant was um, if one dessert was 
comparable tasting to another dessert, but profiled better from a fat loss standpoint. I had to eat the one that profiled better from a fat loss standpoint. To me, again, mm -hmm. economic arbitrage opportunity, and I was an economics major in college. So right. anytime there was essentially free fat loss on the table where something tasted just as good, but it was going to make me lose more fat than the alternative, I had to eat that. But um, I was not allowed to say, well, you know, I want to lose fat, so I'm going to forego eating ice cream. That was never on the table. It was always, mm. you know, make sure that the food is worth the yield, um, just mm. like an investment. And so I took this behavioral economics approach to fitness over a five-year period of time, and I found myself at the end of it applying no more effort than I applied in the beginning, but I lost like 15, 20 pounds of body fat and just was absolutely shredded, still am, but got absolutely shredded without right. a quarter of the effort that people think is necessary to get there. And then I thought, well... Yeah, it's interesting working in tech, but if I really wanted to make a difference in the world, I would teach people how I did this. Right. So let me ask you this, because I feel like the, I, I kind of started on the other end of the spectrum, and I've, I've started to come more towards your understanding of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think we're around the same age. I'll be, I'll be 36 in a couple months. But mm -hmm. um, um, when in, in my you know, late teens and early 20s, I, I was a competitive power lifter. I'm, I'm a midget, too, so I'm like 5'7". Um, and I was at that point in time, 10% body fat, 217, mm -hmm. but everything was measured out. Every calorie was counted because I was trying to make sure like, you know, I could build strength, but I didn't want to get like chubby as hell. Mm -hmm. So I, I, for me, I found in my late twenties and my thirties, life actually got a lot better when I learned kind of how to eat in, in, um, moderation, I guess. Yeah. And I, and I, and, and I guess when, when, when you see that, right, like you see your understanding, you see how a lot of people approach it, how do you respond to kind of the typical, I guess, fitness approach to how a lot of people approach it? Because it seems like a lot of life is cut out, at least in my experience. I think it's for dumb people, honestly. And, and I got smarter as I got older, man. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there, there's, there's not a lot of like really smart people in fitness. There's some smart people in fitness, but most people in fitness aren't sure. smart. And so most people think that if they can do basic arithmetic, they're smart. And it's like basic arithmetic isn't complicated. Obviously, I can count calories, guys. But what a lot of people in fitness don't realize is that you can't actually count calories, right? You don't know how many calories you burn at rest. You don't know how many well, calories. Well, and I think the u the unit itself, too, I think is a bad unit, right? Like it's, the, it's the, the amount of energy it takes to raise boiling water one degree. I'm not boiling water. I don't know about you. So I think at the same time, it's not well, the best uh, unit of measure. Oh yeah, there's multiple reasons why it's not it's not a, a great thing to track. But let's assume that it's yeah. an amazing unit of measure, and, sure. and go from there. Let's say it's an amazing unit of measure. Well, we still can't even measure it, right? You don't know how many calories you're burning at rest. You don't know how many calories you're burning in the gym. If I were to start a diet plan based on the assumptions that most registered dietitians will bring to the table, um, and I said, "Hey, registered dietitian, I want to lose a half pound of fat." Per week, they would say, okay, a half pound of fat per week is a 250 calorie per day deficit. You as a 5'10", 180 pound male, your resting metabolic rate, maintenance calories should be 1,800. You should do another 600 lifestyle activities, and then you should do uh, another 250 in, in training. So you should be eating anywhere from like 2,200 to 2,500 calories a day. And it's like, that's actually less calories than I burn sitting down all day. So if, mm. I, if I were to try to... Uh, run a calorie deficit based on their incorrect assumptions, I would actually be running like a 700 calorie deficit rather than a 200 calorie deficit. And mm -hmm. the FDA permits your food labels to be off by 20%. So you can't, uh, you can't know how many calories you're burning. You can't know how many calories you're eating, you know, beyond, uh, you know, this type of estimate. And you know, what can be better than that type of estimate is your intuition. Yeah. Right, your intuition, if you're training properly, if you're hormonally healthy, metabolically healthy, uh, eating real protein dominant food, your intuition tells you about how many calories you want to eat. Now, mm -hmm. there are some very specific circumstances where that might not be the best approach. And, and if, you're, sure. if you're doing a, uh, a weight category sport where you need to be a certain weight you know, by a certain time period, or you mm -hmm. need to be a certain leanness by a certain time period, 
yeah, probably the intuitive approach isn't going to get you there. Um, but for most people who don't have finite time periods in which they need to accomplish their goals and would actually prefer to extend the duration of their aesthetic gains um, rather than peak and then mm -hmm. decline very quickly, which is how it would be for most sports um, that do have short term goals, it makes a lot more sense. To so so let me let me ask you this then, because I think. Um... You know, like when I when I look at how it worked for me, like I, I kind of just know what my body needs now and what it'll do now. And I, I've realized, like, what's a good weight for me? Right. Like I uh, for me, I mm -hmm. walk around at 165 and I'm, and I'm pretty happy with that. And I still look, you know, like I have some good muscle mass on me. How do you become more intuitive with what you eat? Right. Because I think, you know, you have a lot of people like, let's say they have some hormonal issues. Let's say they have some um, some habit issues that are a problem. So how do you become more intuitive where that's a thing? Because for me, like. One day I just kind of knew what I wanted and I did it for a long time and knew I was there. But I guess mm -hmm. for, for a lot of people, like, that's hard, right? Like, so how do you figure that out? Well, if you have habits, it's a little bit different. You know, that's more right. of like a drug addiction type thing. Or if you're using food as a drug, I always, I always tell people, well, if you're using food as a drug, is that the safest drug that you should be using to elicit the, the response that you want to a drug? And, right. and most people don't frame it like that because they don't think foods are drugs. But if you realize like, no, dude, you're making your body unhealthy, you're eating an insane mm -hmm. amount of sugar, um, and you're shortening your lifespan for a feeling that you're going to get that's going to go away, that's going to require the same substance to elicit a similar feeling the next day. It's like, that's what a drug is. And so, you know, it's, yeah. food isn't always the, the healthiest drug to, for somebody to use. Right. I don't smoke cigarettes and I don't advocate that people smoke cigarettes. But I will say that it's probably healthier for some people to smoke cigarettes than like eat sugar. Right. Because that's what the alternative mm. is. Right. So so right. So don't think that because you don't smoke cigarettes that you don't use drugs. It's like it's if, if you're eating donuts right. every morning, there's probably some degree of drug addiction um, embedded in that. And so I, I have found that gym performance is actually the easiest way to um, remediate any sort of uh, craving or uh, intuitive challenges because the harder you're training in the gym or the more effective your intense training is, I should say, because harder is actually mm -hmm. the wrong uh, adjective, but the yeah. more effective and intense your training is, the more regulated your appetite should be, right? So mm -hmm. if I don't work out for a week, my appetite's going to be much more dysregulated than if I work out hard for a week. If I work out sure. hard for a week, I want to eat protein dominant real food. If I don't work out hard for a week, I want to eat carbs, right? And so if we can get people on uh, intense interval training as well as uh, you know a, a solid resistance training program, their appetites should be regulated from that. Mm -hmm. So I guess in terms of like, because uh, one of the things I found interesting is you're talking about your approach to the gym and, and mentioning like, hey, like, you know, you should have enough left in the tank that you can go back the next day or that you're not mm -hmm. discouraged from that. And and I, I think one of the things that, that's interesting around that is like, I don't know about you, but like, for me, I get bored easy at the gym. Mm -hmm. So like, it has to be something that keeps me engaged. So I've consistently kind of stuck with the same program for like 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, it's called uh, the Max OT. And it's you do like 80% uh, of your max for a minimum of four reps but a maximum of six reps. You do eight to 12 total sets per workout. Mm -hmm. And then I'll do like kind of volume training in between. But volume training is what gets boring for me. It's going back mm -hmm. to the other stuff because it's like I'm beating five pounds or I'm beating a rep or whatever it is. I guess for you, and, and I'm, I'm not in there for more than 40 minutes of time. For you, like what's kind of your your viewpoint on that? Like like what should workouts look like? Like what should you be doing in the gym? What does that type of a you know, uh, expenditure look like? I actually do fairly similar training to that. Um, I, okay. I've never heard that, uh, terminology applied to it, but, um, I'm, I, it's I, like, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, a system that's been around for like a bunch of years. There's this guy, Jeff Willett that had developed it. One of my buddies that had, had introduced it to me in like in high school. And I always just found it to be something that's like, Oh, it's systemized. It's easy. I can do it. And it's motivating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I lift my core lifts are in the, excuse me, typically in the five, six rep range, typically around 80% yeah. of my one rep max. And, uh, you know, I get bored after five or six reps, man. Cause I'm like, all right, like, yeah, this is kind of challenging, but like, I, I want to do something else now. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's just fun. <laughs> it's, it's more fun to do it. And even six is on the high side. Five, five's good. Right. But yeah. I do, I do six too. Um, 
I think, you know, that's typically good for a, a trained athlete. Now, okay. before you're a trained athlete, um, I don't think you're going to benefit as much from that because I think, you know, people in the intermediate and beginner phase, they need to approach weightlifting like somebody who's new to basketball who wants to get better at shooting free throws. And yeah. if you want to get better at shooting free throws, you get better at shooting free throws by shooting free throws. And so yeah. I think, you know, when I work with um, more novice lifters or even intermediate lifters, I'll program more volume for them than I'll program for advanced lifters or for myself because mm -hmm. they they can't recruit as many uh, muscle groups as effectively as a more advanced lifter. So sure. if 20 years ago, you know, before you hit your powerlifting numbers, you probably weighed a similar amount to when you were powerlifting, but you're probably lifting 20% lighter weight. Well, guess what? You oh, can absolutely. recover. You can recover faster from that. And your body is still building its neurological connectivity to figure out how to leverage what's already there. So mm -hmm. you can't actually tire yourself out as much when you're a novice lifter as the same person can when he's neurologically more adapted to lifting weights. Um, and so I think from a, a resistance training standpoint, you know, I'm on, I'm on the same page as you, uh, for what you're describing now, yeah. the, one of the differences between what I do and what a lot of power lifters do is I do conditioning and not only mm -hmm. do I do conditioning, I do conditioning before I lift. And that's one thing mm -hmm. that most trainers will tell you not to do. I post this on Twitter and all these people fatter than me, yeah, so oh, you don't know what you're you know what you're talking about. What about the interference effect? They just have some like name that they read in a NASM book or something, and they think it's true because it has a name that sounds official. I, I, I let my my uh, personal training uh, certification expire many many years ago. It just wasn't worth it. Oh, I mean, I, I wanted to also, and then I got thrown in their deadline funnel like sales pitch, re up <laughs> this that. I only have a training certification for insurance yeah. purposes. It serves no right. benefit. Like you don't you don't need it for effective programming. Um, so we do conditioning first. And the reason we do conditioning first is because most people don't warm up effectively. And so people think that that energy just drops off linearly. It's like, no, that's not how the human body works. Your energy will increase before it decreases. So the purpose of a warm up is to get you so that you're at a high energy output when you're starting your lift and then it'll drop off towards the end of your lift. Most people start cold and they, they can never safely or properly hit what their peak output could be had they properly warmed, warmed up. And mm -hmm. so um, conditioning first helps remediate that challenge. And you know the other thing is we condition hard but short. So I'm not mm -hmm. a guy who's going to be on the, on the Stairmaster for 40 minutes. You know, yeah. I do interval training for 12 to 15 minutes. Okay. That's it. And I, that's all I did for years. To, to get I'm, I'm, cu I'm curious about that because like for me so I do usually do uh, I, I, I run a mile to, to two miles every single morning mm -hmm. um, and I'm not fast you know I mean, it's not like I'm like you know Nick Bear out here or something like that but like I'm at least uh, you know I'm, I'm, I'm doing a decent mile time I usually do that in the morning like around 7, 8, 7, 7 30 somewhere around there and then I do mm -hmm. weights usually around one or two o'clock mm -hmm. um, I'm curious like because do you find putting those two things together kind of like hurts your anabolic window or, or not really, or what's kind of your viewpoint on that? Maybe, uh, but it, it matters more. But I just, I've always had this weird idea that if I do them too close together, it hurts my anabolic window. It might, if you're trying to be the world's best, right? But if you're not trying to be, you know, Mr. Olympia. Yeah, I'm not Mr. Olympia. <laughs> you know, it, it, does it, Maybe maybe you're leaving a couple pounds of lean mass off the table. Obviously, if you run them right back to yeah. back, that's going to be a challenge, right? You want to sure. take 10, 15, 20 minutes between uh, an intent, maybe even 30 minutes in between an intense uh, run or intense cardio event and your lift. Um, a lot of people, you know, can structure their mornings to where you do intense cardio, then you go to emails for 20 mm -hmm. minutes to go drink a smoothie or something like that, and then you can yeah. go lift. And so it's not like you know, it, it's one thing if, okay, you, you rented out a gym and you only have 60 minutes. And so you need to like structure your time <laughs> accordingly. Okay. Maybe that's, right. that alternative is, is not available to you, but if you have some degree of freedom in terms of how you structure your morning, um, yeah, I mean, you can do hard conditioning and then my preference is like 30 to 60 minutes, right? I think you, you still stay warm. You know, I think you yeah. can still get a good lift in a few hours later. 
Um, if it ends up being more than a few hours later, then you cool down from that cardio event. Right. So you kind of lose part of that benefit. But my experience is the optimum time is, you know, 30 to 75 minutes after the intense sure. cardio event. And if you go three hours, it's not a big deal. If you do 20 minutes, it's not a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, something like that. So in terms of like your, your workout duration too, because I, I think at least my viewpoint on it is like, you want to keep yourself engaged. It should be a good workout, but you should have enough left in the tank for your body to recover. Hundred um, percent. I guess how do you, how do you kind of look at that? Uh, that's true. I think it, it, it makes a bigger difference in terms of number of hours per week and the number of hours per okay. day. I tend to train on the long side just because you know my shoulders messed up and, and it has been for years yeah. since I played baseball, and so it takes me a while to go through my whole mobility routine, get everything Dude. ready. I had sh so I I was a, I was a center fielder with it. I used to have a used to have a gun for an arm. I don't anymore. But I will tell you, I had uh, PRP done a couple years ago. You ever had this done? Play no, plasma? but I've heard about they it. They draw your blood, mm -hmm. they spin it, and they inject it. My knees and shoulders. I haven't had problems in three years. It's been incredible. But How anyway. much did that cost? Um, I got it in the family, so it's not the same cost it would be for everybody else. <laughs> I might, I might need to, to get you hooked me up with the family price because no, I've like dude, I, my my because I I was a heavy squatter, so my yeah. knees were shot. My knees are like a twenty year old now. It's incredible. Yeah, like I've earmarked because you know my body, I make money off yeah. my body. So if I can send, extend the duration of my joints, it's worth the capital investment. Um, and so I've thought about doing that. You know, I see not that my body's like Ronnie Coleman's, but like I see that right. he does. Um, that he does, uh, you know, promotions for this clinic in Mexico. I'm like, yeah, I'll go to Mexico and shoot some stem cells in me. Well, you can, so, well, here's the thing is, is if you're doing stem cells, stem cells, um, like, like PRP is good in the U S and it's also better if you're under 40, mm -hmm. it doesn't work as well if you're over 40. Mm -hmm. Um, but stem cells, you can't get as high a concentration because of the, you know, pharma and stuff in the U S as you mm -hmm. can outside of the U S. So mm -hmm. if you're really in rough shape, like Ronnie's in rough shape, you watch a guy right. try to walk. He needs a lot of stem cells to get any better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you or I wouldn't wouldn't need anywhere near as much as he would. Right. So that's why it's encouraging because if you see somebody <laughs> who's in ten times worse shape than you, yeah. and it works on him, you're like, well, maybe it, maybe it'll extend my duration by another couple of decades. Um, what? <laughs> okay. So to, to answer your question, you know, it takes yeah. it, it takes me a while to go through my shoulder mobility routine and all that. Okay. And so I I only lift three days a week now, but my my training sessions last two hours but they're only mm -hmm. three days a week. Now, when mm -hmm. I was younger, I would train for about an hour, but I would train five days a week and I would, and I would do more. Right. So I have longer rest periods because I don't have a job. I just work for myself. I can hang out at the gym and like chill. Um, mm -hmm. so could I condense it from there? Yeah, I could, but like, I don't, okay. I don't have a need to, so I don't. This episode is sponsored by my pillow. Um, my favorite product that I take with me absolutely everywhere. I just spent a week up in Lake Placid, New York on a ski vacation, and uh, I actually have an extra my pillow we leave up at the cabin. Really exciting and uh, keeps me from having neck trouble when I travel. So if you have that and uh, you want to prevent that, <clears throat> you can use my promo code, which is CYOL, and get up to 66% of select products at mypillow.com, up to 66% of select products. Go out and grab my favorite product, which is the MyPillow Classic. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Also, this week, I am on Dr. Jason Dean's uh, new detox, as it's the full moon is coming up on the 6th of January, which is very, very soon. And uh, we are doing our detox of different parasites that are in our body. So... If you guys want to join me on the Parasite Cleanse and uh, cleanse your body from those creepy little creatures that are crawling in there and causing a lot of conditions you're dealing with, <clears throat> you can head over to bravetv.store slash CYOL. Um, you get a discount over there as well. I believe it's about 20% if you use my promo code. So that is bravetv.store slash CYOL. And I, I, I want to kind of come back around to, to the to the dietary portion of it then because, mm -hmm. dude, you're cooking a lot of red meat. And, I, and, I, and I'm curious, mm -hmm. like, is that just what you like to, to post on, on social media or is that a, a large component of your diet that you're eating a lot of red meat? No, it's all, I post what I eat. 
And so okay. I don't, you know, it's not, uh, uh, what you see on social media is actually a fairly accurate depiction of my life. <laughs> I know everybody says that, but it's like, you know, I don't know. I don't have some, some master content planner who's telling me what to post. And oh like, yeah. I, I, I'm not either. I'm just, I'm, I'm just curious. Cause I you know sometimes people just push, you know, post their W's, not their L's, but like, I, no, I guess, I mean, well, you know, I don't, I don't post, I post most of my meals. If, you know, okay. Sometimes the photos don't come out good. So I'm like, yeah, that's an L. I don't, I don't need to do that. <laughs> sometimes I post my L's too. So I'm like, you know, chef Alex, he, the food always tastes good, but sometimes it doesn't look good. Um, but you know, I love red meat. And, uh, and I eat towards my cravings. And so typically if I've been training hard, I want red meat. I want that iron. I want that protein. It just mm. tastes better. Now, if I haven't been training hard, you know, I'll, I'll crave leaner proteins, chickens, you know, seafood, stuff like that. And that's right. what I'll eat those weeks. Um, but you know, nothing helps me recover from heavy training as, as easily in my experience as red meat with some carbs. So in, in terms of that, then like, you know, like, um, how much are you eating? How often are you eating? Like, what, is, what does that look like? So for me, I'm eating like every two, two and a half hours. I don't know what your kind of thought process on that is. And, and dude, I, I'm, I'm weird by the way, cause we raise chickens. So I eat raw eggs like in between meals. Yeah. I used to eat with that degree of frequency. Um, yeah. you know, it, it's hard to say cause I still, I eat okay. three to four meals a day. I eat four meals a day. Right. Okay. I say three, but I always eat a second dinner. So it's like, so that's kind of four, dude. Um, and then sometimes I eat a second lunch. So really I'm eating like three full meals. Well, okay. So actually breakfast isn't typically a full meal. So realistically okay. my lunch is a full meal. I'm not a calorie guy, but I'll say 800 calories, something like that. Uh, dinner's probably a thousand calories. Mm -hmm. And then all of my other meals are probably about 500 calories. Okay. Um, if I had to approximate it and it depends how hungry I am. Obviously if I'm hungry, I'm going to eat more. If I'm less hungry, I'm going to eat less. Um, and then outside of those five eating periods, you know, maybe I have a snack, hundred, 200 calories outside of that 300 calories, mm -hmm. but you know, I'm eating about three, 4,000 calories a day. Um, if I'm to, to explain to you what that is now, uh, I care more about protein and, uh, yeah. and quantity of meat. So pretty typically I'm just going to eat about 1.7 pounds of meat. I just am, I just eat the amount that I crave and it kind of almost always, except if I'm sick, like I've been sick the last few days. So my hunger has been dysregulated, but, um, typically if I'm like training regularly, I'm not sick, uh, 1.7 pounds of meat is just what my body craves. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, typically around 200 grams of protein, sometimes 220, sometimes 180, but it's like around 200 grams of protein and I weigh about 180 pounds. Well, that makes sense. And I, I guess when we're looking like at, at broader society, like, you know, you've really been helping people to kind of like, I guess, get their shit together in a lot of ways. But mm -hmm. when you look at it, when you look at it, like, what do you kind of see as the, the this is going to be the most open ended question ever. But like, what do you see as kind of the, 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 the major problems with people's health kind of, you know, uh, when we're looking at it on a global scale? Well, glo well let's, start, let's start with a Western scale first. Let's do that. People have. As I, I was trying, as I said, I was trying to figure out how to ask the question without making the the broadest question ever. Well, I can't. I can't. You know, the, the answer for people in you know East Africa is not going to be the same for well, yeah, obviously. the people in uh, East LA, right? So, mm -hmm. um, in the West, I think people have become so disconnected from their from their body signals. They right. wake up. They're on an industrialized nine to five work schedule, so they wake up and they think I need to eat breakfast before I go to work in case I get hungry even if they're not hungry, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, it's lunchtime at 12 o'clock, I need to eat. Oh, it's yeah. dinner time at six o'clock, I need to eat. It's like your body doesn't know what time it is. Your body just knows mm. if it needs nutrients or not. So most, like most sedentary people, I think only need to eat twice a day. I don't think they need to eat three meals a day. I think three meals a day is like, if you're doing manual labor, you should be doing three meals a day or more. But if you work a desk job and you're not going to the gym, there's absolutely no reason why you need to eat three times a day. It's just mm -hmm. absurd. It's just, it, it's excessive. And there's really yeah. no reason why you need to eat carbs more than once a day. Cause you're not doing anything that's hard. Right. And so once people start looking at food as something that they eat because they're bored, that's a big problem. Dieting isn't hard, right? Like I'm, I've been on a diet for 10 years. I talk about it in my 10 easy wins for easier fat loss book in my masterclass. 
But you see me post stuff on Twitter. Does it look like I'm on a diet? Does it look like I'm eating in a restricted fashion? Technically, I am because there are some rules that I do follow. And the biggest rule that I follow is only eat when you're hungry, right? It's so much easier to maintain a healthy body weight when you simply only eat food when you're hungry. Just only eat real food and only eat it when you're hungry. Start from there. See where that takes you. If it doesn't work, you'll know pretty quickly. Then you can make adjustments on the back of that. But, Mm -mm. you know, thinking that that diets require some sort of really complex adjustments, for some people who are very unhealthy, they may. But for most people, like, let's just start with eating. Like, let's feel hunger. Wait until we feel Mm -hmm. hunger and eat when we feel hunger. And stop eating when we stop feeling hunger, feel hunger, right? Is that kind of a cultural thing? Is that where we get that from? Like, oh, the family sits down at this time or, you know, the the, the lunch bell rings at this time. Like, is it a cultural thing that's kind of grained into us? Yeah, and you think about, you know, your mom when you're six years old um, says, well, Jeremy, you know, there's there's starving kids in Africa. You better finish your potatoes. Oh, my God. My mom used to say that all the time. Yeah, and think about, you know, I don't know what your family looks like, but I'm going to I'm going to venture to guess that there's more people in your family who are diabetic or obese than are on the brink of starvation. Uh my my, my whole mom's side of the family. So yeah, not that my mom my mom wasn't obese, which is weird, but like a lot of her relatives had those type of issues. So yeah. Right. Okay, so think about these habits that you're instilling in kids. Finish your food because there's starving kids in Africa. It's like there's starving kids in Africa, but there's diabetic kids in the U.S., mm-hmm. which is more likely for your family, right? Why are you telling people they eat when they're not hungry? Mm. It just doesn't make any sense, right? We're solving for the wrong problem. We're 100 years late in our prescription. Mm-hmm. So it's like, yeah, starvation might have been an issue in the U.S. 100, 100 years ago. Yeah. But is it right now? Like maybe in some communities, but certainly not as common as, as the uh, obesity diabetes epidemics. So I think the advice that mothers are passing to their kids, uh, you know, cultural, you know, assumptions about we should be eating this at this time, they're just wrong. Yeah. And if you just kind of step back and say, does this even make any sense? Most people don't even think twice about it. It's like the food you put in your body is like one of the most important decisions you make all day Mm -hmm. and you're doing it robotically. You've never slowed down to think, is this intelligent? Like slow down think does it make sense yeah that's interesting and i i I, I guess when you look at it like i I can see that being a major stumbling block like what other things do you think people run into that are just kind of bad information we're told to like pattern our lives off health wise well anytime people get in trouble they they get put on calorie counts Mm -hmm. right and it's like i mean you can they think and they think oh you know if i'm eating 2200 calories a day i'm on track it's like it's a rough guide, Mm -hmm. you know, do you need to keep your eye on the speedometer every second you drive to make sure you don't speed? Mm -hmm. Like you should generally have a good idea if you're speeding or not. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and I think with, with respect to calorie counts, rather than tell people that they need to count and weigh and measure everything, what's the goal? The goal is to get them to eat less. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, what if, what if you just tell them to only when they're hungry? Would they eat less? Almost certainly they'd be eating less. Right. So why don't we just start with that? Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't work, then we can revert to, to more challenging ways of restricting eating. But then to go a layer deeper, um, when you restrict your eating, if there isn't uh, an associated uptick in metabolic rate, it's very challenging to maintain long-term leanness. So you, you, you'll very likely not be obese if you simply only eat when you're hungry and stop eating when you're full. Um, but if you want to be like lean, you want to be lean like you or me, um, it's very, very hard to have that level of leanness without a training component. Mm-hmm. And I think people put too much, too much focus on the amount of calories they burn in training, Right where if you look at how many calories somebody burns throughout a day, 80% of the calories that a physically active person burns are going to be burned at rest, sitting down, Mm -hmm. standing up, but not moving much. And if we structure our training in a way that's going to maximize the amount of calories we burn outside the gym, what you find is 
training doesn't suck as much in the gym because you can rest and catch your breath more. You can rest longer between sets. You can rest longer between workouts and you don't have to do it as much. Mm -hmm. Um, And you end up doing it at a higher intensity. And it's that intensity that actually leads to you burning more calories outside the gym. Mm-hmm. And so that's the thing that I discovered that a lot of people have probably discovered without necessarily piecing together what's going on is that the intensity, you know, the, the weight that you can lift, the speed that you can run, mm-hmm. these things are going to map to your resting metabolic rate and your resting metabolic rate is going to determine your total caloric burn far more than the amount of minutes you're on the Stairmaster. Well, he, so here's, so here's a thought for you. Cause I think a lot of people listen to this and say, okay, this makes sense, but you know, like, Hey, Alex, you know, you own your own business or, Hey, Jeremy, you own your own business or, you know, like, um, you know, some people now are, are 1099 contractors. So like they have more, I guess, ability to control this stuff. I think, mm-hmm. I guess, do you think the workaday world has to change or will change to allow things like this? Right. Because at the same time, like for a lot of people, if they're not training at five in the morning, they're not training. Or if they're not training at seven or eight at night, they're not training. Right. Like the, the, the day isn't structured for them to be able to do a lot of what they're saying what you're saying um yeah i mean it starts with you have to take control of your life something's got to give right so for me when i had a a corporate job i always trained before work because i knew i I wasn't gonna have the energy to train after work sure and so um and i knew that it was important for me to be in good shape if i wanted to keep making more money for doing the same work Mm-hmm. And so it, it comes, that comes down to priorities yeah. where I was not going to, you know, I was going to miss a work day before I missed a workout. I didn't do miss either, but like I wasn't going to miss training. I, I was always going to train before work. Mm-hmm. And what that did is it opened doors for me that now allow me to set my own schedule. Yeah. So it's hard in the beginning, but the benefit of it, of just going through a, a challenging couple few years is you have more freedom on the back end of it. Yeah. Yeah, challenging couple of, couple of years, man. Like when, when you couldn't go to the gym and you had to like figure out how to work out at home. That w- that was fun for a bit, and then it got boring real fast. <laughs> oh, I moved. I, that, you moved? That was yeah. I found a friend with a home gym. That's how I did it. <laughs> Where were you based during COVID? I, I've been in New Jersey all my life. I haven't I haven't left. My my oh, my, so my parents my parents got pissed, hightailed it, moved to Florida. But like, uh, mm-hmm. uh, I've lived in Jersey my whole life. So during COVID, I was in San Francisco and Oh, good luck doing anything in San Francisco. Right. And so what happened was I was just starting a new deadlifting uh, program in March, 2020. And I was supposed to go to the gym. Like I always did before work and something, you know, hit me. I was like, um, I think I need to get meat. I think getting meat at the store is actually going to be a higher priority than getting my workout done. Yeah. So let me, I'll do my lift later today, but I'm going to get my meat right now. So I show up to Trader Joe's and it's like Black Friday at Trader Joe's. It's like Black Friday Walmart at Trader Joe's. Everybody's waiting for the 9 a.m. store opening and they rush in and, and you know, people are clearing the shelves off. I buy four or $500 worth of meat and I stock up my freezer. I'm like, okay, great. If supply chains break down, I'm good. I can do home workouts for a few weeks. It's not a big deal. And then I thought to myself, there's so many homeless people in San Francisco that if I have food, but they don't, I'm still in a bad spot. And my mom lives in Idaho. Yeah. And she says the grocery stores are full there. So why don't I just go up to Idaho? And so that's what I did. I went up to Idaho. What's funny is I, uh, I bought some Zoom stock and uh, not Zoom stock, Zoom options at the yeah. beginning of COVID because I was like, Zoom's going to go to the moon. <laughs> and, you know, I, it, it you know, went up few hundred percent or something. And so I, I took some of the profits from that, spent a couple thousand dollars on a home gym. And by the time uh, the crunch in Idaho closed, in Boise closed, you know, I just put together my home gym and I just worked out at home for a couple months. Mm-hmm. And so the gyms there were closed, I think, from like maybe mid-April to mid-June. But I just mm-hmm. kept lifting in my mom's garage. Um, you know, I was 34 years old and moved my mom, but I was like, well, it's <laughs> You got to do what you got to do, man, if you want to work out, yeah. right? <laughs> got to keep the game, got to keep the game strain rolling, right? <laughs> exactly. That's why yeah. that's wild, man. It's 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 just wild to see how much the world has changed in the last couple of years. I'm I'm not sure like like how much has that affected you in your industry, like how much the world has changed. It's been very positive for me because COVID was the entry point for me making money online mm. in fitness. 
right? Because people started shifting their attention away from physical gyms towards online. Mm -hmm. And so they started buying more programs online. They started seeking more coaching online. And I don't know how many people were doing online coaching before COVID, but a lot more are doing it now. Yeah. And, you know, it's going to get more competitive. Price points are going to come down as it gets more competitive for the mass market. But right now, you know, you can make a decent living as an online trainer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, perhaps it's because you can draw from a wider audience of people who can who really understand your expertise are willing to pay you for it. Um, but it's been really transformative for me. COVID was the best thing that ever happened to me economically so far. Yeah. We'll see how, you know, we'll, we'll see how the, the house that I bought in 2021, you know, turns out. <laughs> but uh, I, We but, bought in know. 2021 too. Cause I had this, I had this idea that I'm like, Oh, I'm watching the housing market. I'm like, you're never going to get a mortgage like this again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought Biden was going to destroy we, the dollar. We got in just under 3% and I'm like, this is beautiful. <laughs> yeah, so you probably got in. You get in April 2021 because that's when I got in. Like, yeah, like April, May ish, shit around there. That's exactly yeah, because I got like 2.89 or something like that. We we took advantage of everything. Like, I went out and bought a car. We bought a house. I'm like, I'm taking advantage of when nobody's able to buy anything and and getting good rates on everything. <laughs> right, right, right. So somehow I'm not underwater on that. Or, you yeah, know, I don't know how it's still. Uh, appraised at a higher value than when uh, when we bought, but yeah. it is, as, you know, at least as of last year. Um, so, I mean, that's good. Fortunately, that's the case. But um, I don't know how long that's going to be, right? I, right. I think interest rates are going to keep going up. And so, uh, but, you know, the last couple of years, the life that I've led as, a, as an entrepreneur without a boss. Yeah. Completely enabled by COVID would not it would not exist without COVID at yeah. all, hands down. No. Wow. So it's it's been it's been world changing in a good way for you. It's 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 interesting, man, because I think for me, like, it was also a big way to like, I don't know, kind of take the blinders off and talk about everything I I always wanted to talk about anyway. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. start talking about things that matter because I don't know, like, especially online, like we tend to talk about a lot of things that just don't mean anything. And I think what's, right. what's happened, especially with COVID is like, I've just started talking about my own, re my, my real viewpoints. And, you know, I don't mm -hmm. really give a crap about the next online influencer or whatever it may be. Right. Right. Yeah. I think, um, we have echo chambers that we've all kind of drunk, gone into. So we think that a lot more people agree with us than necessarily do. But I think, <laughs> You know, my whole life I've been controversial. I've always said things that offended people and sometimes yeah. taken pleasure in it or more than sometimes taken pleasure in it. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I like controversy. I like defending myself. I like defending my own opinions. So it's not a big yeah. deal to me. And I think, uh, you know, I think COVID and Twitter both allowed for that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Alex, this has been fun, man. For for people listening, yeah. if they they want to connect with you, they want to find out more about what you're doing, or, or maybe they're looking for some help, man. How are they going to find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Alex Feinberg um, One, F E I B E R G One. Uh, DM me. Everything's open. Uh, I see everything. So as long as you're not a copywriter, you know I don't don't respond to those guys. I don't need a new website built yet. Um, but yeah, if you have fitness questions, if you have uh, career. Uh, career questions because you know I, I do a lot of consulting on that as yeah. well. Spent six years at Google, worked in a hedge fund, like really understand the the corporate side of things and, and really enjoy helping people commercially as well as uh, on their bodies. Hit me up with questions. Um, you know I have guides so you can get a little sneak peek of how I think, uh, or you can just browse my timeline because all the craziness comes out there and you can you know deep dive into it. Yeah, and get some some uh, some menu inspirations too, based on based on what you're cooking that day. So so I would definitely recommend people check you out. So so Alex, thanks for hanging out today, man. Thanks, Jeremy. This is great.